Hello again, Psych 370 students, and welcome to another video lecture for week five. In this one, I'm going to be talking about another theory of classical conditioning. This one's called compensatory response theory. And the first thing I'll say about this one is that if you feel like you've got a good grasp on preparatory response theory, which I talked about in my last video lecture, then I think compensatory response theory will be pretty straightforward for you, because the basic idea behind both of these theories is pretty much the same. However, compensatory response theory is best applied to cases where the conditioned response is actually the opposite of the unconditioned response. And so in those cases, the conditioned response is said to be a compensatory conditioned response because it offsets, it compensates for the unconditioned response. So here's a classic example of a compensatory conditioned response. I said toward the end of my last video lecture that if you administer electric shocks to a rat's feet, then that rat will jump, which is true. But another unconditioned response that a shock will elicit is an increase in heart rate. So if you shock a rat, then its pulse will go up. But if you pair a light with shock, if you present the light, then present the shock, light, shock, light, shock, over and over again. If you pair those stimuli, then the animal will eventually acquire a compensatory conditioned response to the light. So its heart rate will actually decrease in response to the light. So the unconditioned response to the shock is actually the opposite of the conditioned response to this stimulus that the animal associates with shock. So its conditioned response to the light opposes, it offsets, it compensates for the animal's unconditioned response to the shock. So that's a good example of a compensatory conditioned response. But before I go into further detail about compensatory response theory, a concept that I should cover first is something called homeostasis, which you might already be familiar with. Now, I have a formal definition of homeostasis on the slide here, but the basic idea is that you wanna keep things on sort of an even keel, right? You wanna keep things like heart rate, body temperature, blood pressure, and so on within a normal range so that the highs aren't too high and the lows aren't too low. So homeostasis is basically a state of equilibrium, okay? It refers to this tendency that we have to keep our internal conditions relatively stable. But of course, sometimes we encounter stimuli that disrupt that stability, that disrupt that balance that we're trying to maintain. For example, electric shock causes a pretty dramatic increase in heart rate. So it actually elevates the animal's heart rate beyond that upper boundary of the range that it's trying to keep its heart rate within. So in order to maintain that balance that we're talking about here, a system, a homeostatic system, has to have some way to counteract occasional disturbances like that. So for example, when heart rate increases, that needs to trigger a process that brings heart rate back down, that brings that heart rate back into its normal range. Well, according to compensatory response theory, it's that after reaction, it's that homeostatic rebound response that the conditioned stimulus acquires the ability to elicit. So to go back to the example where we were pairing a light with shock, the idea here is that the light becomes associated not with the shock itself, but rather with the increase in heart rate that the shock produces. So guys, this is where things can get a little confusing, I think, when it comes to compensatory response theory. Because as you can see in my little diagram here, increased heart rate is the unconditioned response to the shock, but it's also functioning as an unconditioned stimulus that elicits decreased heart rate. So remember, a few weeks ago, when we were covering what a stimulus is, we saw that because it's defined as anything that can affect behavior, a stimulus can be something in the external environment, or it can also be an internal event. It can be an event that occurs inside your body, right? So this state of being, this increase in heart rate is not only the first most immediate effect of the shock, it's also the cause of this subsequent decrease in heart rate. 
So that's why I said that that increase in heart rate is actually playing two roles here. It's the unconditioned response to the shock, but it's also an unconditioned stimulus that naturally automatically triggers that homeostatic decrease in heart rate. And again, according to compensatory response theory, it's that initial increase in heart rate that the animal associates the light with. So since that event elicits a later decrease in heart rate, the light comes to elicit that decrease as well. So I think you can probably see the similarity in the logic that underlies both preparatory response theory and compensatory response theory. Your textbook describes compensatory response theory as a variation of preparatory response theory, and that's how I tend to think about it too. It's like an application of preparatory response theory to cases in which the conditioned response is compensatory. So in this case, with the example that I've been describing, the animal's conditioned response is a compensatory response. It does oppose and compensate for the animal's unconditioned response to the shock, but we could still understand its response to the light as something that it does to prepare itself for the shock. Because after all, by lowering its heart rate in response to the light, the rat winds up minimizing the overall disturbance of its heart rate that the shock is gonna cause, right? And so it's not a stretch to say that the rat is preparing for the shock by getting this sort of head start on maintaining its equilibrium. So compensatory conditioned responses can still be understood as preparatory responses. And that's why I say, again, that preparatory response theory and compensatory response theory are like two peas in a pod, okay? They're very similar ideas. Okay, well, one last thing I should say about preparatory response theory and compensatory response theory is that even though these are important influential theories that can account for a lot of the research findings in classical conditioning, there are some phenomena that they have a hard time explaining. For example, take auto shaping, which I described in my first video lecture for this week. Why does the pigeon learn to peck at the key in different ways, depending on whether the unconditioned stimulus is food or water? Or an even simpler question is, why does auto shaping even occur in the first place? Why does the pigeon peck at the key at all? Again, like I said last time, it doesn't have to do that. It's gonna get the food after the key lights up, regardless of whether it pecks that key or not. So why does it acquire pecking at the key as a conditioned response? How does that response prepare it for the food or for the water? In what way is that response preparatory? It's hard to see how it would be. And in fact, it's especially hard to understand how these auto-shaped responses could be preparatory responses when you consider the case of long box auto-shaping, what we call long box auto-shaping, which I'm gonna let you see an example of with this quick video. Okay, so it's got its food tray over here, which is currently unavailable to it. The key is over here, it's gonna light up, again, that illuminated key is the conditioned stimulus here, that's the CS in this example of auto shaping, and we'll watch how this pigeon behaves in this situation. Okay, so the pigeon actually runs over here to the other side of the box to peck the key, even though it doesn't have to. And as a result, it actually winds up costing itself a few seconds worth of access to its food tray. So again, it's hard to see how a conditioned response like that would prepare the pigeon for the unconditioned stimulus. It's hard to see how doing that would prepare the animal to receive food or water or any other unconditioned stimulus. So like I said before, these preparatory response theories are consistent with a lot of the classical conditioning research, but even they do have some limitations. Okay, well, I have one more video lecture planned for you for this week. 
In that one, I'm going to cover one more theory of classical conditioning with you, which is called the Rescorla Wagner model. But that's going to do it for this one. So as usual, before I sign off here, I'll just say that if you do find yourself with questions about anything I've said in this lecture or anything that you've read about in the textbook, then I hope you'll let me know. Okay, take care, guys.